Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Julie. Hi, Sarah. It is so great to meet you. I have to tell you, um, I've been listening to your podcast over the past few months, and I really, truly admire everything that you do for women in our industry. Um, it's just so great to learn from each other. And I have to tell you, congratulations about um, about being one of the pros to know. A few months ago, you just won that award, and uh, it's just amazing. What a journey you have had, for sure. Thank you. I have been, I think, trying to get that award for about three years. So I was very, very happy <laughs> when I got the notification. I was like, yes, finally we did it. So thank you for saying that because um, it was definitely a very proud moment for me. And I'm excited to have you here. I mean, you've been in the industry a long time like myself, and you are such a great example of what women can achieve. I mean, You've done so many things. You've worked for, for some big organizations. You've held lots of great leadership roles. And so I really think that this is going to be a real inspiration for everyone, especially women, you know, feeling a little bit nervous about how far they can progress in supply chain or maybe even wondering if it's possible to pivot. Um, you know, can I make it in sales if I didn't like it in finance? Those people all need to pay attention to this conversation because we're going to cover it all today. And I can't wait because again, I think you are going to inspire so many. So let's get started with where it all began for you. Where did it begin? What did those early years look like that kind of set the groundwork for this impressive career that you've carved for yourself? So let me take you way back to the okay. beginning, right? So uh, born and raised on Long Island. And you could probably tell from my accent a little bit. Um, but uh, my father, as I was growing up, my father was an accountant working for Grumman for many years. And he used to take work home with him. And when I was a child or, you know, young teenager, he would ask, do you want to help me with my work? I said, sure. Make a little money on the side at a young age. So I would help him add up worksheets, tie things out. And I just started to really, you know, enjoy working with numbers. Mm -hmm. And with that, I decided to follow in his footsteps. So I went to Long Island University. Um, I was a commuter. I worked while I was going through college. I worked at King Cullen as a bookkeeper. Again, wow. so being exposed to numbers at a very young, you know, young adult age. Um, so I studied finance in college and um, I was so fortunate. My first job at a college was working for KPMG, which back then it was one of the big six. Mm -hmm. And um, working there exposed me to so many industries and so many different business models. And I really was very intrigued understanding, you know, financial statements and how companies really become successful. So I think that was really the stepping stone for my career. That's amazing. And so you and I have a little bit of a similar path because my parents owned a freight forwarding company. And so I remember, you know, they brought home work home every single day because they talked about it at the dinner table. And, you know, it was just kind of one of those things as an entrepreneur. And I got involved in those conversations or at least heard some stuff that they were talking about from the business side. And it's incredible how that sort of shapes you, right? How those conversations stick with you and how they kind of shape your passion. And so true. Right? Yeah. Being just, just what you're exposed to at a young age. I mean, you just, uh, you, you know, you learn so much. You don't realize you're such a sponge at that point. I know. I know. I know. So you mentioned KPMG and you mentioned having access or exposure to a lot of different industries. So talk to me about how you ended up in supply chain. Um, and I think you started in supply chain with a multi-billion dollar New York Stock Exchange listed global company. Talk to me about that. Yeah. So um, I, I worked at KPMG for about three years and unfortunately a life event occurred where I lost my mom and I, um, 
I needed to make a career move because I needed to be home for my family at that point. And, you know, when you're working for a public accounting firm, you're bouncing around from client to client. So I felt like I needed to be rooted more at home. Um, So I started to look for another job and I just connected with a recruiter that, you know, found this opening financial analyst role at MSC. So I said, okay, it's close to home. It's good. My skill set looks like it matches. Um, so I went on the interview and MSC, I never heard of the company before. And it was a much smaller company back then, uh, you know, an industrial tool distributor. And here I am a 25 year old female, right? Going to work for an industrial tool distributor. Ooh. So, uh, but the people that I met throughout the interview process, I mean, they were just so engaging the culture. I felt the culture immediately of the company and I knew it was someplace that I wanted to join. Um, and again, the skill set match. So little did I know when I accepted that position, that was back in 93, little did I know that that was going to be the start of something really amazing for my career. So when I started with them, they were $170 million company. Mm-hmm. A few years later, they went public and I was working in finance. So went through the whole public offering, working on schedule wow. night and day, which was so exciting. And, and then, you know, you fast forward 26 years later, I, when I left, there were $3 billion company. So needless to say, it was just an incredible journey for me and so much opportunity, which, you know, I'll share with you. Yeah. And so you talk to me about your journey with MSC, because I think you held some leadership roles in many different departments. You mentioned that you started off as a financial analyst. Um, but, and then you also help them with the acquisition, maybe the going the public, going public as well, the customer solution. And I think that's great because I always talk about trying different things, right? You got to try different things to see what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you like to do, what you don't like to do. But I also understand that in some environments that could be easier said than done. So how are you able to move through the business that way? And what advice would you give to a professional looking to do something something similar because i mean supply chain there's so much opportunity right there's so many different things that you can do within supply chain even in finance um but i think people get stuck and they don't necessarily want to ask about what that opportunity could look like so what what do you think about that yeah it's a great question and you know fortunately for me at that point in time i had joined a company that was on a high growth trajectory, right? So they were investing and expanding. So that that really set the groundwork. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, new new departments were opening up left and right. New positions were opening up left and right. And I started in the finance department, and due to the the massive expansion that was going on in the company, there was a need for a financial role embedded in the finance organization as they were going through their geographic expansion. So I was asked to move from finance to sales. Okay. Like, wow. wow. I know That's nothing this. about this, right? I know nothing about sales, but yet they need my skill set over there. And at first, you know, I was hesitant, but I said, why not? Why not? Let me move because it's the only way I'm going to learn and grow. So, you know, I I would just say I was just fortunate enough that so many opportunities came my way and my advice to others in the industry, and especially women, is take the chance, be open to change. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, it's scary. It's scary. And I would, I say, you know, to, to those that I work with, you know, my peers, those that report to me, it's okay to feel comfortably uncomfortable because that's how you know you are, uh, you're developing and you're growing as an individual. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's so true. I mean, I'm uncomfortable in most things that I do. (laughs) And people are like, really? I'm like, yeah. (laughs) So just do it. (laughs) Just do it. And you know what? We make a ton of mistakes along the way, but that's okay. That is okay. Now, and it's interesting because I feel like we think that everybody's watching. And so when we do that, we're like, 
catastrophizing, if that's even a word, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. The, the, the mistake or, you know, that we're making. And in reality, people aren't paying attention that much. That's true. It's true. And every, they make mistakes too, you know, we look, we'll get to learn from each other. It's very, 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 very true. So you are now president at True Source. So tell us a little bit about True Source, what you do, but also tell us about your role as president, because I'd imagine it truly is bringing together everything you've learned over the last, you know, several years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so True Source um, is a leading national facility maintenance service provider. And what we do is we do break fix and preventive maintenance service work um, across many trades, doors, docks, locks, fence, gates. We do janitorial and glass. So very, very skilled team. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we are really the first call for our retailers. So we are a proud partner of over 50 of the top 100 retailers across the country. Wow. And in this business, service is key. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first took on the role as president of True Source about a year ago, I mean, that was my main focus. How are we going to deliver top-notch service to our customers? Mm -hmm. What's important to our customers, right? We have to show up on time. We got to be able to fix their emergency situation. 30% of our work orders come in an emergency status where they 30%. need 30%. Yeah. yeah 30%. Wow. That's big. Yeah. So they need somebody out there stat and, you know, we got to be able to fix the problem right the first time so they can get back up and running and, you know, and they got to secure, secure their store and their operation. Um, so let me bring it to life for you actually. Right. So you have a big box, we have a big box retailer. I'm not going to name who. And, um, they have a truck waiting outside of the loading dock to unload all the inventory to stock the shelves and the dock seal is has malfunctioned okay so now the truck cannot connect to the dock and they can't unload uh they call true source so we we immediately dispatch an affiliate a technician that's in the area that can show up very quickly go out has the skill has the parts on their truck in order to fix the dock hmm. now crisis averted right the truck's able to unload and they're able to stock their shelves so that brings to like what we do yeah. And well, and I'm glad that you shared that story because when we think about supply chain, right, when I when I mentioned earlier that there's so many moving parts, there really is. And facilities management really is a key component to supply chain, because like you said, if a dock goes down and a truck can't be offloaded, waiting time, right, there could be, um, you know, there could be somebody waiting for a part for a line and the line could be down. There could be some life-saving medicine that is in that truck that needs to be offloaded, that needs to get to somebody. And so there are little things like this that are so important and make such a big impact to this industry. And so I'm glad that you shared that story. Now, what's your role like as president of an organization like this? And, you know, the fact that you are focusing on customer experience really means you're a true supply chain professional because I feel like supply chain is all about relationship, right? It's all about that customer service. It's all about those networking opportunities to really get to know somebody. It's it's so true. And again, just keeping service at the forefront. Um, you know, first, it's really understanding the needs of your customer, right? You need yeah. to sit back, you need to listen, you need to understand their needs, you need to understand what their service level expectations are of you, mm -hmm. okay? And and then, then you build your strategies and your plans and you execute. So, you know, the three main areas that I really focus on in order to get to that best in class service experience is number one, um, we outsource our service to an affiliate network, so we don't have in-house technicians. So I'm now relying on a third party right. to deliver best-in-class service. So that affiliate network is so critical for us. Um, you know, it's building strong partnerships. 
-hmm. It's making sure our affiliates understand our customer service level expectations. And it's measuring their performance. So we have scorecards for our affiliates. We hold them accountable Mm -hmm. to meeting those service level expectations. And as we continue, you know, to augment our trade offering, it's making sure you have the geographic coverage. So so constantly onboarding new affiliates. Right. And I hate to say it, but, you know, maybe firing those that aren't delivering and finding new, right? Finding new. So that's one key component. Uh, The next, which is, you know, obviously um, supply, you know, inherent in supply chain is the parts availability. Yeah. So when you think about it, in order to fix that job right the first time, you need to have parts either on the truck. So we have to, we we actually just revamped our whole part strategy to really focus in on what our affiliates need on their Mm -hmm. trucks versus what do we need to inventory because it has such a long lead time, right? But we, so we need to make sure we have it on hand for our customers. So parts availability is key, but I had to tell you, Sarah, what really makes the difference in this industry, it's our people. We have an amazing team of tenured skilled trade specialists. They know our customers. They know what they need. They know what products needed to get the job done. They know the affiliates that are really strong. And um, they're the ones that make the difference. And they are empowered when you think about the emergency situations we need to respond yeah. to, they are empowered to make a business decision. So I'm so proud of what love they that. accomplished. I love that. Now, part of that too is understanding the market, right? So let's talk a little bit about that because I think we're seeing increasing costs, more demanding retail environments, increasing risks. So what are you seeing from your perspective? What are your customers thinking about? What challenges and opportunities are they dealing with right now? Yeah, I mean, as as you know, and everyone knows, retail is really struggling right now. Um, inflation has not gone away. So costs are increasing. And unfortunately, consumer spending is, is decreasing, right? Uh, you know, we monitor foot traffic as an external indicator for our industry. And hmm. foot traffic continues to decline year over year. Um, so our customers are looking to cut, cut costs. Um, so, so let me share with you how True Source, right, helps helps to address that need. So, True Source, being a service provider across multiple trades that I shared, mm-hmm. our customers can consolidate their facility management spend under one service provider, mm-hmm. right? And by doing that, they're going to get consistent service across the country because we're national, and they're going to get consistent pricing. So they will be able to, you know, procure a better price point, consolidate all that spend through one supplier. Um, And to add on to that, you know, if that's not challenging enough, that costs are going up, our customers are now experiencing theft and crime. So I was going to bring that up. When you first talked about facilities management and you first talked about like fences and different things like that, the first thing that came to my mind was theft. And I know that theft is on the increase. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. It's really crazy. You know, you know, the world we're living in today, no accountability, no consequence. So doesn't appear that this problem is going to go away anytime soon. Um, So True Source has solutions, right? So we are here to address um, this challenge for our customers. So we have entry, entryway, entry door solutions, um, unbreakable glass, shutters, um, shields, grills. So whatever our customers need to protect that entrance, um, yeah. you know, in order to avoid theft and crime, we're here to support them. Well, and also I think protect their people too right because that that also helps protect people which is probably top of everybody's mind right 100 percent. yeah absolutely at the end of the day that's all that's all that matters 100 percent. yeah so on the flip side of that what have you found um what like what would you like to talk about in the industry like what do you love so much about supply chain i mean since you and i started our careers a lot has changed I think that evolution is exciting. It can be daunting. It can be overwhelming. Um, so what's kept you in the industry for so long? What's kept your interest and kept you excited? 
you know, I have to tell you, it's just been an amazing journey and I've learned so much, but what motivates me every day is coming in and having a purpose. Mm -hmm. I remember when working for MSC, I'd learned about um, Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. Okay. And everything has to be, your center is your why and your purpose. It's not the what, it's not the how, but it's the why do you exist, right? So I've always grounded myself in that. What is my purpose in support of the bigger purpose of the organization? And at MSC, you know, our purpose was to make sure our customers' manufacturing tools were working and were driving, you know, effectiveness and they were able to keep their operation running, right? In support of supply chain, right? The production line running and efficiency. And at True Source, obviously our purpose is to be there to, to address our customers' emergency situations. They depend on us. They trust in us. Mm -hmm. And we need to show up and we need to get the job done um, right, you know, right the first time. So always having that purpose ground me is really what motivates me every day. And then I get to work with an amazing group of people, like I said. I love what I do. And we have we have fun while we're doing it. It's challenging. Uh, but we have a lot of fun and we celebrate our successes a lot. Good. I love to hear that because I think that's one of our downfalls sometimes. It's, yeah. We get super busy and we do the to-dos. I mean, I know this happens to me all the time. And then I don't celebrate the wins or the successes. How do you celebrate those wins with your, your team? And how do you figure out which ones to do and which ones, you know, not to do? Or yes. do them all. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, there are certain ones that really stand out, but... Um, you know, I, the majority of, of my team works remote, you know, in okay. this new world, right? But we have our leaders that are um, in offices, but we do, we do pull the remote teams together, you know, through town halls, through focus groups, and that's where we celebrate. We'll send out DoorDash certificates for yes. lunch, and, um, you know, we just, we, uh, we just have fun. Yeah, I love that bring lunch in. We just, we just keep the engagement level up. Good, good, good. Yeah. We do uh virtual holiday parties or Love like it. virtual half year parties and then virtual holiday parties. The last one was Pictionary. <laughs> uh, oh, that, was a, that was a lot of fun. So if anybody's looking for ideas, let me know because I have, I've been doing this for a number of years, but that's one of the things that are fun and they're very, very important. Now you mentioned challenges right? What have you found challenging about the industry over the last 30 years? What has been your experience as a woman? Because you've been in two very male dominated mm -hmm. um, environments and, you know, between sales, finance, acquisition, supply chain, facilities management. So what does that look like for you? Yes. Yeah, so absolutely early on, it was a challenge. I mean, it was a challenge working in a male dominated industry. Um, there were so many times I'd be sitting around a conference room table and I was the only woman in the room. Mm. So, you know, I think though, I think though that I put up a barrier because I wasn't confident at first, mm -hmm. you know? So I pushed myself through that own barrier that I put up. To speak up. Okay. And then, yeah, maybe at first my voice fell on deaf ears. It did because nobody really knew me. You know, maybe I was not tenured as much as everybody else was, but I was learning and I was growing. So what I did was I asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid to ask questions. And once I felt that, you know what, I had a perspective that could bring value to the table, I started to speak up. And as I moved throughout the organization, I asked questions and I learned and I started to speak up. The trust built over time with all the other cross-functional leaders in the company. I was asked to, you know, sit on lead projects. And, and I just think it's pushing through that barrier and never giving up. You cannot give up. Just because you have one bad experience where you don't feel comfortable, don't give up. Because, you know, you're smart, you're intelligent, and you have value to bring to the table. 
It's interesting that you said that because I had a conversation recently with somebody about all or nothing thinking. And a lot of times it's one of our defaults as human beings is that it's all or nothing. If this one time doesn't work out for us, that's it. It's not going to work for me. I'm done. But in reality, what really does work is, you know, being like, okay, well, it didn't work for me that time. It doesn't mean that I cannot try again. And I think that's where a lot of people falter. But one of the things that you said, because I've been talking to a lot of um, younger women, younger generations in this industry, and a lot of them get very frustrated. Like you and I have been in the industry for a while. I I let everybody know I've been in the industry for 25 years. And, you know, they'll say, well, you don't need to have 25 years experience to get hired or to be listened to or this or that. And one of the other things that you said was trust takes time. What do you say to that generation when they are frustrated that they might not be getting certain positions when they feel like they they should be getting it, but it's going to somebody that does have, you know, that 20 years experience? And I think there's a place, and the reason why I'm asking, I think there's a place for everybody. I think there's an opportunity for everybody. I think we do need to take a chance, but I don't think that we need to hurt each other in the process. It's not them versus us, us versus them. And I think we got to get out of that mentality. So I just want to get your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Look, it could get really discouraging out there. And, you know, one thing I find is, you know, the younger generation, they've been on their phones forever, right? And the relationship building, um, they need to work on that. They need to work on those interpersonal skills. And that's going to build confidence over time. And, you know, at the end of the day, just don't just don't give up be persistent and you know whatever self-learning you can do whatever um mentorship you can find out there however you can build your resume Mm -hmm. one you know one step at a time it's going to get you it's going to get you that job of your dreams at some point and don't forget at one point you're you're going to be in our position having 20 to 25 years experience (laughs) so that is going to come Uh, But I think you're right. You know, it takes some time to build relationships. It takes some time to build trust and trust and integrity are really they are very essential. It doesn't mean that that you don't know what you're talking about. It means that you might just need a little bit more time. And even if that one person is like, oh, you don't have enough experience, it doesn't mean the next person is going to feel the exact same way. You know, we've had to learn our way through. And I think there's something to say for that technology aspect um, and the learnings that come from that. But then also the historical knowledge that we bring to the table as well. And so I think it's, again, it's not us versus them or them versus us. I think it's how do we learn from each other? Because there's so much to learn. Right. And creating that safe environment, telling somebody, you know, um, I'd love to learn this from you and I'd be able to reciprocate and teach you, you know, this if this is something that you're struggling with. And I think it's opening up that dialogue, opening up that communication. And that builds trust a lot easier as well, rather than, you know, you're not hiring me because I don't have the experience, right? And so I think it's just a different approach. And so I really, um, I'm really glad that you um, helped me sort of work through that because I've been hearing that so much. And I think it's important that we listen to each other and we all have those perspectives. But in researching for the show, I had a little look around your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that your daughter is a finance and accounting student. She's following in your footsteps. So how do you think the industry has changed? How is the one you stepped into different from the one that she's stepping into now what advice have you given her about navigating the journey that's ahead of her and maybe replicate some of your success yes so um definitely a a different world uh her you know she's one more year college left and uh you know then her entering the workforce so ironic how she's following my footsteps and i fall out of my dad's footsteps um so I think what's really different is is technology advancement, as you said, and the role that AI is going to play, uh, the, the role it's playing now and it's going to play in the future. You know, if I, if I look at my daughter, um, finance major, I think the role of a financial analyst is, is going to change in the future. Um, we're going to have AI tools that are going to do the data mining for us. 
-hmm. And it, it will um, do a lot of the analytics for us as well. So I see the role of an analyst changing over time to be more of like a consultant, right? Okay, AI is going to serve up the data, mm -hmm. and the analytics. Now, what do you do with it? You're looking, you, you need to be a problem solver. You're going to yeah. need to have those interpersonal skills. You're going to need to have those leadership skills. The finance is always going to be needed to understand. But now you're more of a problem solver. You're not spending the time mining the data yourself. Yeah, the exceptions management. Right. Everything that I've been talking to, uh, not only just finance, but different supply chain roles, a lot of people ask me, you know, what skills should we be learning? And one of them is really the, the exceptions management. You have to understand the technology and understand how to work within that technology. However, you'll get training once somebody brings in that technology. You can't understand it all. Um, but those those soft skills that come with problem solving are definitely something that um, I think professionals need to look into. Yeah. And and you asked me about what advice would I give her? Um, yeah. You know, so again, just be calm, you know, build your confidence up over time, ask a lot of questions and don't ever give up. Um, hone in on those interpersonal skills and, uh, you, you know, build strong relationships because you have to rely on others. Like, you know, success doesn't come on your own. Yeah. And you ask, have to rely. And ask really good questions. Yeah. Don't ask a question. Just ask a question. Ask really good, good questions. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've always, and I've always surrounded myself with people, you know, that had subject matter expertise. It's okay. It's okay to bring somebody else in. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you said something, you said something earlier. Um, it, it's gotta be all or none. Yeah. You know, my mantra has been don't let perfection get in your way of progress. It, it's, it's all, it's all a journey. Yeah. And, um, my, my staff here and I, and our management team, we've all gone through, uh, Kai, a Kaizen process, you know, as we, we transform our service organization and it's about continuous improvement, right? Yeah. You're, no one's perfect. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up continuous improvement. It's really important. Um, I don't think that we send our teams to enough conferences. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start doing that a little bit more. There's only certain people that usually go to conferences, but I think there's so much benefit in having teams meet with other teams from other you know, clients. Maybe if you're going to a technology conference or a user conference from the technology, and there's so much um, information exchange that we miss out on when yeah. we don't send different people because there's only so much that you can learn online. Um, and so that's just one thing that sort of come up with, come up for me recently that I wanted to mention, but over the course of your career so far, you, you know, what has been your biggest highlight and achievement? What are you most proud of? You know, there's so many milestones and highlights uh, over the past 30 years. Um, you know, if I think back at MSC, what stands out, um, is really being a highlight of my career is when I was leading the acquisition integration team. Um, we were doing so many acquisitions at the time and leading that team, I would have to show up day one on site when the announcement was happening with the acquired company. And I, I actually just loved being there meeting the people, putting them at ease, you know, ensuring them that they had a job mm. and then taking it from there and assimilating them into now our culture. Um, and then finding those synergies, you know, we bought the company for a reason, right? What are those synergies? And then executing that integration plan and, and bringing real value, creating real value for all of our stakeholders. So, I love that part of uh, our adult. That is really hard. And it's nice to know that that was a highlight for you because that can be really difficult for a lot of people. So yeah. finally then, what does the future hold for, for you? I mean, I imagine you have a lot of big plans as president of TrueSource. Yeah, look, I, I um, hope to be here at TrueSource uh, for many more years. Um, you know, our 
our vision is to be best in class and we are well on our way to accomplishing that. Awesome. Um, you know, it's continuing to strive to be the best. And, you know, we have, we have the best team in the industry. Um, so I have no doubt that we're going to get there and there's so much share to be gained. Although retailers are challenged right now, there's still so much market share out there. So mm -hmm. it, it's an exciting time for me and, um, and the team. And, and, you know, personally, I would like to give back to the community and find some, um, structured mentorship programs um to get involved in and um pursuing some board positions as well so i can help you with that we're going to talk about that when we uh when we press stop record but you know i'm excited to see where you go i thank you so much for sharing all of the things that you have experienced at conversations that you've had advice that you've been given because you've you've really spent your career growing, right? Honing your skills, trying new things, and that takes a lot of courage and commitment. So your passion now in laying the foundation for more women to succeed in this space, right, is fantastic. You said that there is power in sharing our stories, and I couldn't agree more. So thank you for being so open with us today and showing all women and other underrepresented people just how our hard work and authenticity can really get you. So did you have a guess at today's big question? Well, at the top of the show, I asked you, according to a 2023 National Retail Security Survey, what was the total cost of reported losses due to theft in 2022? Well, retail losses swelled to a huge $112.1 billion dollars in 2022, up a shocking 19% from $93.9 billion in 2021, as if retail didn't have enough problems. Julie, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story on our Woman in Supply Chain series. It really was a pleasure. Sarah, it was really an honor to uh, be here this morning with you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to get to meet you and get to chat with you. And I uh, really look forward to learning from your future podcasts about, from other women as well. Thank you so much.